Um, it's my enormous pleasure to be here. I'm a big fan of TED, and I have used the TED as a kind of educational videos for many years, so it's great to be part of that tradition. I want to start by asking you about the breakfast. Uh, so how was it? Did you enjoy it? Yes. Okay. Uh, did you pay attention? What were you eating? Or is if you have to rate your attention from say one to 100, how much you were present to what you were eating? You don't have to answer me, just keep in mind as we go through it. Because the reason I ask, it's not a trick question because the topic of my talk is pay attention and live tastefully. And that does not only mean tasting the food itself, but it's about life. So for the next few minutes, I'm going to run you through, I'm going to introduce you something, the gift we all have, and the gift which if we are deploy it properly from day to day life can radically transform the way you live your life, the way you relate to your surroundings, to your friends, your family, and above all, to yourself. Okay. And I'm going to put up the context for this. I'm going to talk about attention in the context of the mental health problem which we see rising in our society, and especially in the campus. It seems to be that the more we are doing well in our society, worse we are feeling. Some of the statistics which are coming around is alarming. And though some of the mental health problems needs to be managed medically, but part of it can be used, can be managed the way we live our life from day to day life. And the attention is a very important part of it. Because I think part of the reason why we are facing so many mental health issues in the campus and also elsewhere is because our misunderstanding of how the life works. And I hope in the next few minutes I'm going to run you through some, some of the principles. If you apply it, it, you will benefit tremendously. Now, the thesis of my talk is just if you can learn to deliberately pay attention to all the things that are happening in your life, the good and the bad, and observe it like a scientist, it can radically transform the way you look at mental health and the way you look at life. Now, why it is important to pay attention? Now, we used to live in a time when we always said that uh, we repeated Rene Descartes' famous quote, I think, therefore I am. And then to which somebody retorted, I think, therefore I'm confused. <laughs> to the point where in the, in the times of Facebook, Twitter, and the social media, we come to the point where we are starting, I share, therefore I am. And each time, the way we share information, the way we are couched within the large network of information, and we are transformed every single moment the way we interact with it, it changes our definition of who we are. It seems like every time, in the words of Sherry Turkle, who wrote a really interesting book, Alone Together, that each time you want to feel something, you say, I want to have a feeling, so I should send a text. Before, we used to live in a time when you would say, I want to have a feeling, I need to make a call. So there has been a radical shift in the way we are dealing with the people. It seems like we expect more of technology than from each other. That's one reason why we need to pay attention. Second reason is that all these things happens within the limited resources our brain has. Brain does not have a lot of attention. Uh, does not have a lot of resources. So every time you pay attention to something, you do it at the expense of something else. Each time when you are eating something and you're talking to your friend, either you're sacrificing the quality of the talk or you're sacrificing the taste of the food. You cannot be in two places at one time. It's not tricky, it's just the way brain works. For example, brain cannot process two things at the same time if you fire information within 500 milliseconds. That's one scientific reason. 
Another reason is this. We live in the world of the Facebook, Twitter, as I said, social media. We seem like immersed in this idea that we need to be doing things all the time in order to assert our, what we call, self. And it is leading us to here. We are becoming kind of a poodle on a crack. We are becoming so attention deprived that it seems like we cannot pay attention to one thing at a time for a long period of time. And that creates a problem. Not only it creates problem in the brain itself, it creates the problem in the way we relate to the things, relate to the people, relate to the people around us. Okay. The most important part, why we should you pay attention, is very simple fact. We need to understand how our mind functions. All of us have some idea, maybe it is a vestigial, how the mind functions from outside. You read some textbooks, you had a talk with a prof, or you simply had some, some ideas of yourself, how the mind functions. But most of us do not know how it feels like to know the mind from inside out. How does it function when you close your eyes, when you feel distracted, when you feel really, really you need to get up and walk away. The moment when you feel that I need to be doing something else because this is not good enough. That kind of mind, if we need to know, we need to pay attention because there's no other way you could do that. The reason we are so focused on making multiple things at one time, at another time, is because we have somehow lost the art of paying attention. Now, the very simple thing is how do you can cultivate the positive mental habits? Because the, the, the crux of my talk is not about pointing the limitation of attention, but the point how you can cultivate certain habits, certain way where you can enhance your mental health. The, the kind of things we experience because of the lifestyle and because of the, the thinking we have. Now, the idea I'm going to introduce you to is very simple. That if you can learn to observe all the things that is happening in your life, all the events, all the people, all the circumstances, within the framework of universal law of impermanence, it can radically alter the way you react to the things. All you have to do is simply not react and observe like a scientist. This universal law of impermanence is as valid outside like as valid as inside. The chairs and the tables which have a shelf life the same way our thoughts and feelings have a shelf life. Some, you will notice at every point of the time, a thought arises, it stays there for a little while and dissipates. Another one arises, it dissipates. Sometimes some thoughts take longer to dissipate, but every single thing, regardless of how bad it is or how good it is, it is subject to the same law of impermanence. And I think that's one of the keys, the way we enhance our mental health, because often we are reactive. Good thing happens, we jump like jackrabbits. Bad things happen, we feel ourselves in dump. So neither we learn from the good thing, nor we enjoy, nor we learn, nor we enjoy the good thing, nor we do the, we, we are not able to focus on anything. And the reason, you would, most of the time we are focused on the good things. And one of the reasons why should you actually pay attention to the both part of the story is when we pay attention and when we desire only the good things in our life, it leads to what we call the excessive craving. Excessive craving leads to attachment and it creates what we call the mental imbalance. And you will know when you are craving for even a piece of chocolate or new shopping or new anything, it creates the imbalance. The same thing our habit is that we like to have more what we like, and we like to have less we don't like. But the problem is life doesn't work that way. Life is going to throw under bus here and there. So how are you going to deal with it? So the only way we can deal with it is simply by paying attention to the good and the bad. Because if you are focused on not having the good, it leads to aversion, hatred, and that will create another Im imbalance. It leads to what we call equanimity. When you are able to face your life as it is, you are able to understand 
that things pass. Good and bad both passes. Sometimes people ask me that, would it flatline my life? If I have to observe the goodness just in the same way I observe the badness, is it going to make my life not enjoyable? In fact, it's the opposite of the truth. When you know that the good thing you are experiencing has this limited shelf life, you will find it urgent to experience it. Because most of the time, we are hurtling from one good thing to another, never enjoying what really good is. And the second thing is we are able to understand experientially how our mind functions from inside and out. It develops the area, this kind of attribute, this kind of paying the attention, develops the area which creates positive mental health, happiness, enthusiasm, uh, compassion, all the good things we enjoy in our life. It also chips away from a neurobiological perspective all the areas which are known in negative emotions, like sadness, fear, all those kind of things. It slowly, slowly chip away those areas. We know that people who are more stressed, they have actually larger amygdala than people who are not. I want to show you one slide which shows what happens to the brain if you choose to pay attention for a longer period of time. Not too long, if you spend around 27, a minute, 27 minutes a day for around eight weeks, what really happens in the brain? If you see one slide, this is actually a study that was published uh, 2011. If you see the slide, if you see the bar, the left hippocampus, which is known to be involved in memory and some other areas in our brain, has seemed to increase in size in the people who went through an eight-week, what we call mindfulness-based stress reduction program. Just spending around 27 minutes a day for eight weeks, the area of the brain which helps you learn and to control other part of the functioning tends to grow bigger. Another four areas, like posterior cingulate uh, cortex, temporal parietal junction, and other areas of the brainstem also tends to grow in size. What is notable here is that all these areas I'm showing you, they are involved in what we call learning, memory, emotional regulation, perspective taking, self-referential processing, the way you relate to yourself and the way you relate to other people. All the things which we create in the sense that the way you look yourself, the way you, there's a way you, when you look in the mirror and you see your picture, the mirror does not have any mind. The word doesn't tell you anything. It just simply faithfully reflect back what you are presenting to it. And the, the, the quality of the image, the way you like or not in the image, is going to be dependent upon what the quality of your mind at this moment. Because not every day you like yourself and not every day you hate yourself. Things keep on fluctuating. This is actually more dramatic, uh, diagrammatic version of the same. So there has been in the past five years around six studies published which has shown experimentally through MRI studies that our brain changes according to the attention we pay to the certain things. Now, I want to wind up, but I want to wind up leaving you with two things, very simple things which can be applied in life. One thing is that Attention is a trainable skill. If you feel that you have a less of attention, it may be because the way you deploy it. So if you choose to train your attention, and maybe that's why all the attentional training programs, which sometimes are also called mindfulness-based programs, are able to decrease the attentional deficit. It is useful in autism, and useful in a spectrum of activities which can help us become better human beings. And once you start to paying attention, it's, it architecturally changed the brain which support all the positive mental habits. So once you become, we know from the studies in neurobiology that the people who are more stressed tends to have a right prefrontal activation yeah. and the people who are more enthusiastic and happy have tend to have um, left prefrontal activations. The good part is that this tends to change as you go through the process of sadness and happiness. If, for example, you see a comic movie, 
the left, right, frontal, uh, left frontal activation is going to spike up, and then it is going to fall down. If you watch it, for example, you go through a sad experience, the right is going to spike up, and then it's going to go down. What happens, there's a baseline that happens in the brain. One of the biggest things I want to leave you with in the society where we are chastised and criticized for every single thing, that there's actually more right with you than there's a wrong. We often live in a world which comparison is, in fact, prided upon. We say that we need to learn from each other. But those comparisons, though they are good in some way because they make us progress, in fact, all this comparative thinking has brought us all this affluence we see. Yet, it has a dark side. Because you could be an you cannot be equal to anybody else. It is impossible for you to be like anybody else. You, in some ways, you will always be better, and you, in some ways, you will always be worse. And if you, if you tend to think, the only way you can find what is right with you is simply turning your attention inward, only sitting and working with the things which we call our mind. What is good in you can only be discovered if you pay attention the entire spectrum of your life. And the only way you can actually do that is by paying attention. And I think that's the idea worth sharing and spreading. Thank you very much.